This is section 17.1, Vector Fields. Chapter 17 is amazing, so let's see what's going on here. Vector fields are the main object that we talk about in chapter 17, and you should have enough background now where we can actually finally put this little arrow over my head that says we are going to talk about vector fields. This section is all about just getting a handle on the data type. We'll actually start talking about what the data type does later in the chapter, but we just wanna know what in the world is a vector field? If you just look at what's over my head, what we've been, how we've been classifying data types before, they're, they're usually functions that have an input and an output, like a function that has an input of a point in the plane and an output of a number, or the input is a point in space and the output is a number. Here, the input, the input is a point in space and the output is a vector in space. So the, it's still just a function. It still has an input and an output, but the objects are different enough that like we need to name it differently. So these are called vector fields. So what, 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 what is a vector field? Like where do they show up? What's their deal? The main source of vector fields is, well, not the main source, but the first source of vector fields is what actually happens when you take the gradient of a function. So remember this was a couple chapters ago. You could take a function of, it, was, it could be either two or three variables you just take the gradient of the function. Well, the gradient of the function um, still takes an input of x and y, but then to find the gradient, you put the x partial derivative of the function in the first slot, and the y partial derivative of the function in the second slot. So this is the gradient of the function f at the point x, y. And the question is, wait a minute, what is this thing? This thing takes as inputs, you input a point in the plane. And the output is a two-dimensional vector. It's two numbers. It's also in R2. So this gradient of f we were thinking of it as like the gradient of f gives you a vector, but no, really, if you think about it, what the gradient of f does is it waits for you to hand it a point. The gradient of f takes a point and gives you a vector. So gradient of f has input of points in the plane, output of vectors, two-dimensional vectors. In this situation, it is called a vector field. More commonly, the ones we'll deal with will be the vector fields in space because like we live in three dimensions. So that's why I've only labeled R3 to R3 up here. And that's this situation where, well, here's my function f. I can take the gradient of f. I put the x partial in the first slot, the y partial in the second slot, and the z partial in the third slot. What do I have? You might think, oh, well, the gradient of, a, of this function is a vector. But not really. If you really look at what gradient of f is, it takes as input a point in, the, in space. And its output is a vector in three dimensions. So this object, gradient of f, we didn't really tell you before, we just had you play with it, but gradient f is an object and it is a vector field. It takes an input of a point and its output is a vector. So that's to try to convince you that even though vector fields are complicated, you've seen them before and so they're not particularly scary. So um, what is a vector field? Like we, we wanna actually write down a definition. I just showed you what they look like, but not all vector fields come from the gradient. So a vector field over a plane region is a function of two variables whose outputs are two dimensional vectors. So a vector field, since it's a complicated object, we would generally use a capital letter to talk about it. So we might say like F and we'd say, well, your input is a point and your output is a vector in two dimensions. And you'd have to name what to put here, maybe like M, N, 
Oh, I don't like MN because now in three dimensions I want to do MNO. <laughs> That's not good. I just won't write it. So a vector field over a solid region is a function of three variables whose outputs are three dimensional vectors. So other than the gradient, which is kind of like an abstract thing for you, where, where do vector fields come from? Vector fields are most often seen as force fields or velocity fields. So if you imagine what a vector field in space has to do, it has to be that every point in space, like, like all the air in the Earth, uh, around the Earth, at every point in space, there's an arrow. And that tells you a uh, like magnitude and a direction. Why would we ever have that situation? Like, why would you ever assign a vector to every point in space? And the easiest answer to that is if you just look at a wind map. So here I have the wind map from um, October 30th, 2012. I'm not recording this in 2012, but this was um, a hurricane that weirdly made landfall up in like the near New York City. This was Hurricane Sandy. Um, if you think about at every point on the surface of the Earth, you measure the wind, that wind gives you a magnitude, it's like 12 miles an hour wind, and a direction. So that, so wind maps are vector fields in the plane. They take as input a point on the surface of the Earth, and the output is a vector. This, the way that this is organized, the, um, this picture, it doesn't show you vectors, but you can imagine that like, oh, if you were standing at this point on the Earth at this time, then you would get an output of a wind speed and a direction. If you were standing here in Chicago at that time, you would have had 20 mile an hour winds, and you may not have realized that this was just all part of the, the like, hurricane system. Um, yeah. Any time that there is a force acting, and it's acting different ways in different places, you can think of that as a vector field. So for example, gravity, the gravitational field, is a vector field. At each point in space, you feel a different amount of gravity, and it points in a different direction. Um, where we are, we feel the gravity mostly pulling us toward the, the center of the Earth. But technically, like this book over here is pulling me that way too. If you add up all those forces, you get one single force vector, and that's a vector field. Um, the vector, the, ve the, vo the gravity vector up here is a little bit different than the gravity vector over here. So the input is a point in space, and the output is a vector, and they mostly point down. <laughs> um, I think we can get back into, we can get into playing with vector fields more later. I think I want to... What happens if I click next here? Oh, this was at landfall. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy times. Um, yeah, okay. So let's get back into the, into the notes and continue on to page two. If you're curious where this website is, it is hint.fm slash wind. And you can get the current, um, I'll write it. hint.fm slash wind. <laughs> I misspelled wind. And you can get the current wind map. It's kind of cool. Okay, um, let's practice a little bit with vector fields. Um, but you should have in your mind that like a vector field is not a crazy thing. Anytime there's a force on you, and that force is different depending on where you're standing, that's a vector field. So uh, let's sketch this vector field. So f of xy is y minus x. At each point, I get a different vector. So at 0, 0, like to plot something, I'm just going to plot it the same way I've plotted functions forever. I'll plug in some inputs and get some outputs. At the point 0, 0, the vector I get is 0, minus 0. So cool. I have nothing to put at the origin. What about at the point 1, 0? At the point one zero, I get the vector, well, x was one, so I get a minus one here, and y was zero, so I get a zero here. So what you do to graph this is you go to the point one zero, and you put a vector pointing in this direction. Oh, let's try some more. Zero one, 
0, 1 would get this vector. And we can just figure out what shape is going on here just by plugging in a whole bunch of points. 0, 1, that points up. 0, minus 1. 0, minus 1. y equals minus 1 would go here. So I get this. So this vector field, it seems to be spinning. If I pick a different point, like let's try 0, 5. Now y is 5, so I get 5, 0. So this one is like this. And I can tell from the pattern that this is what I'm going to get. Let's try a point out here, like um, 2, 3, just to see what we get. At the point 2, 3, I get the vector 3 minus 2. So it goes over 3 and down 2. So this vector field, it's like a, it's like a vortex it's spinning around. But it doesn't seem like it's like spiraling inward or anything. It seems like it's just spinning. No, let's try minus 1, 4. At minus 1, 4, I get the vector 4, 1. Whoops, minus 1, 4 is not there. Minus 1, 4 is up here. So the point you pick is the starting point of the vector, and then you go um, in that direction. If you actually draw arrows everywhere, then you will end up with a huge mess. But if you kind of like space out some points and pick some points and just plug in some points and see what vectors you get, then you can get an idea that this is apparently like a vector field that like spins around. I do want to show you a website that is really good for viewing vector fields in the plane. And um, all I remember is what to Google to get to it because it's like a person's name who made this. It's Anvaka Field Play. I think I have it pulled up. Yeah. Um, over here you get some, I don't know what programming language this is, but you can get some syntax help up above this that's cut off in the video. If you search for Anvaka Field Play, you'll be able to find this. Um, let's just get it to give us a picture of the one that we just were working on. It had, the vector field was y minus x. So here's a visualization of that vector field. And the way that, the, that this program is finding this visualization is it takes a point, it checks out what the vector is at that point, so like, um, say you start here at this point, 0, 5. It says, ah, the vector is pointing that way. Then it moves the point a little bit that way and checks the new vector. And now the vector is pointing this way. And so it moves it that way a little bit. And it keeps doing this. That's called integrating the vector field. And you go and like, it figures out what path the points would follow, like if they were being blown by this wind, this vector field being like the wind. And the end result of this vector field, y minus x, is this spinning shape. So like, like I said before, the arrows aren't like pointing in and they're not pointing out. So this is just a vector field that just spins around in a circle. You can put whatever you want in here to like play with it. I don't know, let's get 2 times p dot y. Um, if you've messed something up, then it'll tell you down here. And if you've done some computer programming, this won't be surprising. Like. Um, no multiplying integers and floats, so you have to tell it 2.0. So if you do 2y comma minus x, you get this vector field instead. Um, what if you square it, like 2y and then minus x squared? Now you get this vector field. And basically, with really simple formulas, you can still get really crazy vector fields. Let's make this minus 2xy. So now there's like a column of the storm in the middle, and then every path like zooms around and dead ends into the negative y-axis here. And you can zoom in and zoom out and stuff. It's pretty awesome. So, and there's a bunch of settings to play with. You, should, you can just play. That's why it's called field play. <laughs> anyway, um, I show you how to draw it by hand. You should use computers to visualize vector fields, especially in the plane. Visualizing vector fields in space a lot trickier. Um, 
I don't know the software that does that. Maybe it exists. Okay, um, here's some specific vocabulary for vector fields, is where, um, what if all the vectors point toward or away from the origin? This just happens a lot, where like the wind is all sending you in, or the force is all sending you in, or the force is all pushing you away from something. Um, so that happens often enough that they have a special name called radial vector fields. Um, yeah, so it will turn out that we really like vector fields of a certain type, which is vector fields that look like this, where f of x, y is this specific kind of radial vector field. So it has to be a multiple of r. That's what makes it a radial vector field. Um, but this kind, where it's r to the p, is the specific kind that we like, that will like turn up all the time. The gravity vector field turns out to, turns out to look like this, where all you do is the vector is the same thing as, the force vector is the same thing as where you're standing, but it's scaled by a power of how far away you are. Um, the Newton's law of gravity is down here. It basically says this. It says that the force is pro inversely proportional to the square of the distance. That's That would be this part here. Um, what this formula doesn't tell you is which way the force is pointing. So if you just use this formula, you have to say, oh, well, yeah, the force is a vector, but you know what I mean. I'm just telling you the magnitude. So how would that look in this formula? How that would look in this formula is you would separate out the direction. Like, here's the direction. Here's a unit vector, r divided by its magnitude. And then there would be a scalar here, which is this. So um, the actual like gravitational vector field ends up looking like this. It's, we know that this is the radial component. It points inward. It points like opposite of where you're standing. And here's the direction vector. This is a unit vector. And then the magnitude is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Um, and then there's some constant here. And the constant is, it has to do with the masses and the gravitational constant and so on. So this would be your um, gravitational vector field. I think the weirdest thing that surprises people about this is that this form ends up having a cubed in here. Because um, you're so used to seeing the squared from physics, but in, in actuality, the, the vector field ends up having the it has like square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared all to the third power all this together and so you have a three halves power appearing like in the gravity vector field and I, people normally see the three halves power as like a very strange exponent but it's actually the exponent that's like all around us all the time so let's look at the last page um, the last page points out that a, your easiest source of vector fields was to take any function and take the gradient of that function, and that gives you a vector field. So, like, we started with this function, f of xy is x squared y squared from the first page, and we took its gradient. Um, if you build a vector field this way, like, if the vector field comes from a gradient, then the function that you started with is called the potential function. And the gradient field that you get, the notes I have here are wrong, but the, the field you get where you take the gradient, this is called a conservative vector field. If you know any physics at all, we're like winking real hard at physics here when we say anything that comes from a function, if you take the gradient of that function, then those two objects immediately get kind of like a physical interpretation, which is that one of them is kind of like potential energy, 
and the other one is a vector field that has a conservation law. Um, that's not specifically what we said here, but the words have been chosen specifically so that like you can make that connection. So um, anything, any vector field that comes from a gradient, it has two names, it's called a gradient field or it's called a conservative vector field. So let's say that you have a, um, oh, this is just summarized here. If you have a function and the function is on either a plane or in space and you take its gradient, that thing is called a gradient field and the function is called the potential function. So let's, let's make some. Suppose you just build a potential function. You just like start with a function. This is a function where the inputs are points in the plane and the outputs are numbers. When you take the gradient, you end up with a new object and it's a vector field. So let's take the gradient. This is phi. The gradient of phi is, well, take these, take the partial derivatives. Um, derivative of arctan is one over one plus u squared um, times the derivative of the inside. So the x partial derivative of this function is one over one plus the square of the inside times the x partial derivative of the inside function. Then the y partial derivative is same deal, one over one plus the inside squared times the y partial derivative of the inside function. So here's a vector field. And the point is because we know we built the vector field by taking the gradient, then we know that this is called a gradient field and we get to call this function its potential function. So we're like hinting at physics. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. These, if you draw level curves of your function and your function is a potential function, then those, um, the level curves now have a fancy name, which is that they are equipotential curves. Equia meaning same and potential. So same potential. These are the places that have the same potential. I'm trying not to say potential energy. The, the same potential where the, this function tells you how much there is. So um, let's sketch some level curves. Remember to sketch level curves, you pick output values and just plot what you get. So like we're looking at this function. Um, let's just try where the output is zero. How could arctan of xy ever be zero? Well, arctan of arctan of zero is zero, so we would need xy to equal zero. Is there any other angle whose arctan is zero? I don't think so. I think um, f of x equals arctan x looks like this. So the only the only input, yeah, so I guess we have xy equals zero. Well, how does xy equal zero? That happens when either x is zero or y is zero. So here's my um, equipotential curve for potential zero is right here. It's both axes. Okay, now let's try the curve, the level curve with height one. Well, how do you get, um, one is like really awkward. Like you can pick whatever level you want. Um, I guess because arctan should output an angle, I should pick nice angles as my levels. So instead of picking like one, two, three, instead I'm gonna pick like pi over four. Pi over four equals arctan xy when xy equals one. So I should graph xy equals one, and that's another um, equipotential curve. It looks like this. If I go out further, like, oh, that's not pi, pi equals one, that's pi equals pi over four. Um, 
What's another good one? Maybe like pi over 3 is a reasonable angle. The tangent of pi over 3 is square root of 3. So this would be xy equals square root of 3, which means this curve is just like another hyperbola, but it's out a little bit further. In these other quadrants, we would get these quadrants if we picked negative potentials. So um, like if I picked minus pi over 4, I would get xy equals minus 1, which is here. Let's see what this, since we have a nice thing that like draws us a picture of the vector field, let's see what the vector field looks like. And then we'll like try to compare that to what the level curves of the potential function look like. So I'm going to get this vector field drawn in field play. It's in the x component, I have y over 1 plus x times x times y times y. I don't know what the um, what the syntax is for powers because I don't know what form what like <laughs> I don't know what language this thing is written in so to get x squared y squared I'm going to use um, x times x times y times y and I'll switch to it here in just a second So over here, I've written that the velocity in the x direction, the, the, the vector component in the x direction, is the y value over 1 plus x squared y squared. And the vector component in the y slot is x over 1 plus x squared y squared. So I've just typed in um, this, this vector field. Now, when we go look at what happens when you like follow the vector field, you get the same kinds of shapes as the equipotential functions, or as the equipotential curves. But it's not exactly the same. So what's happening? Like how are the how are these vectors? The, the vectors are what you can see here on this picture, which is that they're like coming into the middle and then like headed out along a certain line. What do those have to do with the potential function? And the answer is, like, let's say you started down here. If you started down here, you'd be at a very negative potential. It'd be like down here. And what the vector field does is it takes, it, it like heads in the, it, it's heading this way. And then it heads up this way. So this vector field, the gradient vector field, it, it makes shapes that go like this. What is it doing? What it's doing is it's going uphill as much as possible. Down here is like negative um, altitude, if you're thinking about it as levels, negative potential, and then it gets higher and higher, and out this way is where the really big high numbers are. Yes, that's what the gradient does. The gradient points uphill. So if this is your contour map, the one that I drew by like sketching the level curves, then the gradient is like all the directions you would walk if you were trying to walk hill uphill as fast as possible. The uphill directions are up here in the northeast and down here in the southwest, as you can see by the level curves. So this is just what the gradient does. The gradient vector field at each point it points in the direction that gives you mo the most increased potential, the most, the, the highest increase of your function. I'm slipping up and letting physics words in all the time, but maybe that's actually better for you. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's essentially all I've got for you for vector fields is that like they're fun to play with, they're pretty, and um, some of them come from taking the gradient of a function. If your vector field comes from taking the gradient of a function, it has a name, and uh, that vector field is called a gradient field or a conservative vector field. And we'll talk about this more, um, this conservative thing later. So 
practice some 17.1 before you go on and like use these objects because we're going to be using them for the rest of chapter 17.